Welcome, 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 welcome. Um, you are in Symposium 19, Approaches to Nutrition in CF, Emerging Trends. My name is Katie McDonald, and I am joined by my co-moderator, Elizabeth Reed. We are so pleased and excited um, to present the hard work that our speakers have put together for you today. It's going to be an exciting symposium. Thank you. Our speakers today include Jordan H. Robeson. Uh, she is here from uh, the University, it's the UMC Health System in Texas. Um, Dr. Virginia Stallings, our hometown girl, right? What? Yeah. And uh, then John Lohman. He is Dr. John Lohman, I should say, PT, uh, joining us from the University of Alabama at Birmingham. Kimberly A. McBennett um, from Case Western Reserve University. We're very pleased and we'll, we'll give you a, more of an introduction to each of our very illustrious speakers. Our educational objectives today are to describe the demographic changes in nutritional status among individuals with CF over the last decade, to discuss current evidence related to weight management, interventions for people with CF who experience overweight or obesity. We're going to explain the role of exercise, activity, and lifestyle change intervention for uh, persons with CF um, who are dealing with overweight and obesity. The format for our symposium today, all four speakers will complete their presentations in sequence. There will be no Q&A until all the presentations have been completed. And then we will have a pro-con panel with all four speakers joining us here. And uh, we will be discussing medical and surgical interven interventions, intensive behavior management, uh, weight neutral approaches, traditional weight management, and comprehensive lifestyle change. Our proposed outcome, a person with CF will collaborate with their healthcare team to cultivate the individualized nutrition and lifestyle plan that results in the healthiest and happiest lives possible. We're very pleased that this session is being live spring streamed, and we want to welcome um, everyone who's watching outside of this room. We're very excited about the presentation, and um, we're ready to go forward. And our first speaker, Jordan. It is my great pleasure to introduce Jordan Robeson, a registered and licensed dietitian as well as an adult living with cystic fibrosis. Jordan received her bachelor's and master's degree in nutritional sciences and dietetics from Texas Tech University and became an RD in 2016. She's passionate about promoting a healthy relationship with food and improving body image for those with cystic fibrosis. She's been involved with the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation for over 10 years, that's how I found out about her, and spoke at NACFC in 2021 on body image and cystic fibrosis. She also co-wrote a chapter for the CF Reproductive and Sexual Health Collaborative Resource Guide on Body Image. She currently lives in Lubbock, Texas with her husband Jason and their adorable son Cohen. She works at an outpatient cancer center where she strives to improve the quality of life of those undergoing cancer treatments. In her spare time, Jordan enjoy, enjoys traveling, reading, writing, and baking. Good afternoon. I'm gonna make sure I have my timer up here so I don't go over. I've got one for you. Oh, thank you, wonderful. Thank you, everything. Well, I first want to start off by saying thank you to everyone um, for attending today's session. Thank you to Katie and Elizabeth for asking me to be a part. It's truly um, my honor and privilege to be here with you today and, and this week. 
So, um, my title, CF Weight Management, it's personal. Um, there are no relationships for me to disclose today. Today, I will be talking about problems that can arise with common nutrition interventions today, um, how weight stigma affects health. I want to discuss health at every size, also known as haze, and I will also give a patient's perspective on weight management as well. So I think a lot of us are already pretty much aware of why we're talking about weight management and this change that we've seen in the past few years. Um, but just to give you a brief overview, um, we have had intensive efforts to increase BMI um, in the past many, many years. Um, but thanks to highly effective CFTR modulators, we're also seeing an increased life expectancy, which I'm truly so grateful for. Um, but we also know that genetics and even social determinants of health can play a role in our weight. So some common nutrition interventions that we see, not only in just cystic fibrosis, but I think in other populations as well, um, when we have the goal of increasing or maintaining weight, um, because we know that an increase in BMI is correlated with an increased lung function, we tend to push the high calorie, high protein diet, and we utilize oral nutrition supplements as well as enteral nutrition. When we have the goal of weight loss, we may recommend um, watching our portion sizes or um, a calorie deficit. We tell our patients to eat food that is quote unquote healthy or good and not to eat the quote unquote bad foods. Um, and we also recommend exercise. I think we have to point out though what all of these interventions have in common and that is that they are weight based. We focus on the number on the scale to determine our patient's health. Um, and so if I were to ask you, you know, before saying that, what do you think the, the goal of these are? You might say health. Um, but I think, again, that these are more weight-based with maybe a secondary focus on health. So as clinicians, we are trained to believe that a lot, um, or that weight loss is just really simple. We just need to eat less and exercise more. Um, but the reality is that research shows that intentional weight loss can, even though it does show that intentional weight loss can be achieved with certain lifestyle changes, um, there's issues with some of that research. Um, Typically, the timeline for that research is really short. They tend to be less than five years. So we're not looking at long-term weight loss. Um, and there's a lot of other issues that can, that can happen with that research, which we'll look, about, look at in here in a minute. Um, but we also know that there is actually a lot of research that provides us with evidence that sustained long-term weight loss is really not possible for the, for the vast majority of participants. Anywhere from a third to two-thirds of individuals will actually gain more weight than their starting weight four to five years after the diet ends. And that's why the timeline of that research is so important to look at. So I know you're also thinking, well, if I'm not recommending weight loss to my patients, what about chronic health conditions like diabetes and heart disease and cancer? Um, and we are told that fat plays a significant and direct role in causing diseases like heart disease and diabetes. But a lot of that evidence is actually based on epidemiological, epidemiological studies, which only show association, not causation. There's also a lot of possible confounders in those population-based studies, and that can include social determinants of health, level of fitness regardless of weight, weight stigma or weight bias, which we'll discuss, as well as weight cycling. Um, one study I do want to point out um, noted that FEV1 was significantly higher in patients or persons with CF who were overweight and obese. And so if we truly are wanting health for our patients, we want higher lung function, right? And so why are we so focused on the number on the scale? We also know that dieting can lead to a preoccupation with food and weight, which can lead to disordered eating. It can also lead to psychological, emotional, and spiritual distress. And what I think is so important to, to mention is that people living with cystic fibrosis are already struggling with these things um, for all kinds of different reasons. Um, but why would we want to add to that? 
So my first recommendation for clinicians working with people who have cystic fibrosis is that you need to be aware of your patient's own perception of their weight, their diet, and their body image. How do they feel about it? Because what they feel should help you determine and help you work with your patients to say what our goals are here. So next I want to discuss weight stigma and how that can affect health. Weight stigma is also known as a weight bias. Um, weight stigma can lead to a decrease in health-seeking behaviors, higher cortisol or stress levels. Patients can be more likely to have disordered eating, um, more likely to avoid exercising in public for fear of shame. They're at a higher risk for psychological problems and they're less likely to return to doctor's appointments if that's where they are experiencing the weight stigma. There is um, an important sentence on here that you will see on the next slide as well. Um, <clears throat> weight stigma is an independent risk factor for a variety of negative physical health outcomes like diabetes and heart disease, regardless of the person's body size. And researchers in one study actually found that the health risks posed by weight stigma are greater than those found by eating quote unquote bad foods. So weight stigma can actually be worse for your health than the foods that you might be eating. We also have to discuss that weight stigma doesn't just happen for those that are living in larger bodies, but can happen for those of us living in smaller bodies as well. The same health issues can arise no matter the size. Did not mean to rhyme. Um, but um, again, I say weight stigma is an independent risk factor for a variety of negative physical health outcomes like diabetes and heart disease, regardless of the person's body size. I also want to point out that someone in a smaller body may not be that body size because they're quote unquote healthy, right? Um, I think our society and our culture tends to place people in a thinner body on this pedestal and they say this is what health looks like. But that's not the case. And someone who's living in a smaller body may not be that way because that they're healthy. They may have experienced cancer. They may have an eating disorder. They may have just lost a loved one or they might be living with cystic fibrosis. So what does contribute to our health? Um, our health behaviors like diet and exercise do contribute our, to our health, um, but they only tend to contribute about 30%. 20% of our health comes from our access to and our quality of our health care. 10% comes from our physical environment, but 40% of our health comes from our socioeconomic factors like education, employment, income, and social support. So my recommendations for you as clinicians are don't assume anything about your patient's lifestyle or behavior based upon their weight. First, ask your patient about their habits out of concern for their health, not the number on the scale. We need to be asking every single patient that walks into your clinic about their diet, their exercise, their sleep, their stress, everything, because we care about them as a whole, not because we care about the number on the scale. It's also important that we focus on interventions to improve health that do not include weight loss. So what does that look like? So what if we took a weight neutral approach to health rather than a weight centric approach? So let's talk about health at every size or haze. Haze is a weight inclusive anti diet approach to health care that's designed to help you take care of your body without trying to shrink it. It was originally developed in the 1990s when we started seeing a lot of emerging research coming out showing that intentional weight loss doesn't work and can actually cause more harm than good. So how can health at every size help our patients? Um, we acknowledge that health at every size says that health looks different for everyone. So just like we're talking about today, it's personal. It should be individualized. Um, it says that numerous factors go into our overall health, which we have briefly discussed. Um, it also emphasizes that all aspects of our lives should be cared for. And above all, it fosters self-compassion over shrinking our bodies. So the goal here is self-care, not self-control. 
Health at every size is associated with a lot of positive things, including an improved quality of life, improved cardiovascular endpoints and physical activity, a reduction in disordered eating and binging, improved diet quality, and some studies have even shown a decrease in fat mass, BMI, and waist circumference. It's interesting that when we focus on caring for the body as a whole, weight loss can be a byproduct of that. So how can we help our patients develop a healthy lifestyle and include self-care, not self-control? Um, we know that exercise is really good for our health. And so we're going to hear from um, John today, who's going to talk a little bit more about that. Um, but I would encourage you to help your patients find physical activity that they like and enjoy so they can be more consistent with it. Um, it's also, I think, helpful to incorporate intuitive eating. And I wish we could have an entire other presentation on intuitive eating today. Um, but a couple of main points I would like to point out with that are that there are no good or bad foods. So there's no food police. Um, we do want our patients to eat mindfully, so to honor those hunger and fullness cues that our body sends us, and to learn to cope with your emotions without using food. Nutrition is also important. So we want to eat fruits and vegetables and whole grains and the things that we know that are going to add to our diet. Um, but it's not only a mix of, it, it is a mix of choosing for health, but also choosing for pleasure. So enjoying what you eat. We have taste buds for a reason. Um, eat a variety of food and food groups, but choose foods that help you feel your best. It's also important that we help our patients take a look at how much sleep they're getting, um, how, how and why they get stressed, what stresses them, and help them learn to cope with that. The bottom line here is to take the focus off of weight. And as we looked at in the very first slide, we said that our, our interventions are weight-based. So we want to take a shift, we want to shift away from that. Um, I would actually encourage people to throw away their scales if at all possible. So I would like to talk a little bit about my story with weight management. I've included lots of pictures. I was told that that is very important. Um, so you'll see pictures of my adorable son, Cohen. Um, so I want to acknowledge that I have the privilege of living in a smaller body, and I recognize that that is a privilege. Um, but I've lived my entire life in a smaller body. Um, I really didn't have any trouble maintaining or gaining weight growing up. Um, but it, when I entered college and started trying to be a registered dietitian, I was working two jobs and I was in a sorority and I was doing way too much. Um, but I started having a hard time with weight gain at that point because I've learned about myself that when I'm stressed, I don't eat, I lose weight um, because I have better things to focus on than food. Um, but because I was having a hard time with weight gain, I started being told, Jordan, you've got to eat. You've got to push the calories. You've got to get it in there um, by everyone around me, my care team, my family, my friends. Um, and so that became what I was focused on. So again, preoccupation with food um, really started happening and with weight. After struggling so hard with trying to gain weight, I couldn't do it anymore, and I received a feeding tube in August of 2015, um, and it was really then that I truly became obsessed with numbers, whether it was the number on my pant size, the number on the scale, the number of calories in my food, you name it, I was obsessed with it, um, and I was just constantly trying to gain the weight, and it was, um, it was really hard and very stressful um, for me. Flash forward to January of 2020, and I started on one of the great CFTR modulators that we have today. I was really hoping to gain the 20 or 30 pounds that I had been hearing about from some of my friends with CF, and that is just not in the cards for me. Um, my genetics do, are not gonna allow that, so um, I was able to at least have some weight maintenance, and so because of that, I was able to have my feeding tube removed um, about two years ago, so the picture on um, um, the, the right side is me after just having removed my feeding tube at home by myself with my doctor's permission. So um, it was a very exciting time. 
Um, I went to a clinic appointment a few months later in um, 2021, and I stepped on the scale and realized that I had lost a few pounds. And I really don't have pounds to lose anyway. Um, nothing had really changed for me except that I had become a foster parent just a couple of months before that. Um, we had not been parents prior to that, and so it was a big change. Um, I was worried about this little girl that I was taking care of, and we were going back and forth between family visits, um, and so I was stressed. Um, not only that, when I stepped on the scale in that clinic visit and saw the number, I let that number determine how I felt about my body, and I let it determine my emotions at that time. Um, I cried and cried throughout that entire appointment, and my nurse came in and was just like, oh, oh no, <laughs> you know, what's happening? Um, and so she kind of warned everybody else before they came in that I was emotional and, um, you know, going through something. And so they came in and talked to me, and I, I was just so worried that they were going to have me you know, put my feeding tube back in. Um, you know, what was gonna happen because of that number on the scale? And so they had a conversation with me and were truly, really compassionate, which I was so thankful for. Um, and they, they helped me to realize, you know, okay, Jordan, nothing else has really changed for you. Your PFT numbers look great. You are working full time. Um, you're taking care of a little girl. This is, this is a change for you. Um, and so just continue to focus on you and the weight will come back. And they were right. But I'm really truly thankful for my care team. Um, we have a social worker there um, that's here today and I'm really thankful for her um, because she really helped me get back on my feet. Um, I met with her virtually a couple couple of times um, for some counseling sessions and um, just really thankful for you. So, um, but that's what a care team's for, right? That's why you are all here because you care about your patients and um, that's what I had experienced that day. Um, so I started to make sure that I was focused more so, you know, on how I was feeling. Um, today I do have a scale, but we keep it out, out of mind, <laughs> out of sight. Um, I really only use it for virtual appointments, which I've just started being able to do um, because my health is so good. Um, and I used it some during pregnancy just to make sure everything was going okay. Um, I continue to exercise in ways that I enjoy several times a week because I know that that's good for my health. Health, but it's good um, for my mental health as well. I continue to eat what I want, but keep in mind, I'm also a registered dietitian, so my diet tends to be a little healthier maybe. Um, and I, I know what foods do for our bodies and how they can truly help our body. Um, but I only choose foods that I enjoy and that make me feel good. So now the pictures you've all been waiting for. <laughs> um, so again, I, I tend to focus so much more on how I feel rather than what any numbers say. Um, you know, can I keep up with my child? Can I exercise? Am I able to attend to work regularly? I don't let the number on the scale determine how I feel about my body. For those of you that are interested in the numbers, because I know you're out there, um, but my current BMI is around 19. So it's a little bit on the smaller side than maybe we encourage our, our, our uh, patients with CF to have. But my lung function in the past several years has been anywhere from 90 to 100 percent, and even above that. Um, my last hospital, hospitalization was over 10 years ago. So I'm really grateful for that. But there's a lot of people living with CF who are experiencing other things when it comes to CFTR modulators. They maybe have gained the 20 or 30 pounds. Um, and so I wanted to read some testimonials from other patients with CF. I have their permission to do so. I'm in a Facebook group for those who are on a CFTR modulator and just asked if they would be willing to share anonymously. And so I'm going to read these to you here in just a second. A mom of two children with CF said, Trikafta has significantly improved their BMI, but it has created a unique challenge. We've pushed food and calories their whole lives. All of a sudden, their dietitian is telling them to reduce calories and that they no longer need supplements. This is great, but the change frustrates them. It feels like they are having their security blanket yanked out from under them. An adult with CF said, I went from having to push calories and worry about illness-induced weight loss to having to watch everything I eat and still gain weight with smaller portions. 
I've gained about 30 pounds now, and it doesn't ever seem to come off, even with exercising. It bothers me that I have a lot of belly fat now. Another adult with CF said, it's been really hard to rewire old habits, like eating constantly after Trikafta. I've tried to slow the weight gain with exercise, but I still pack on weight. It was hard at first to adjust to my new body, but I'm slowly getting used to it and accepting that this is the size I was meant to be. I feel stronger when I look at myself in the mirror as opposed to just bigger. I had already gained a lot of weight after going on antidepressants a few years before Trikafta, so I haven't been CF skinny in a while. But I still gained a good amount of weight with Trikafta. It's really weird to have a normal sized 30 year old body after being emaciated for much of my 20s. I'm really trying hard to keep active while trying not to obsess over the scale or develop unhealthy obsessions about my new body. So as you can see, there's a wide variety um, of experiences here. And so my recommendations for you as clinicians would be to consider a health at every size approach for your patients, keeping in mind this may not be appropriate for all of them, um, but helping patients understand and acknowledge their personal hunger and fullness cues and what that looks like, um, and how certain foods can make them feel and contribute to their health. Determine with your patient their long-term health goals and help them to achieve those goals. Be mindful of what may be contributing to a patient's health status outside of diet and exercise. But number five is to be compassionate. Your patients have gone through so much in their lifetime. And I cannot stress that enough. And you know that. You've been with them for probably years. You've seen what they've walked through. Sit with your patients and how they are feeling about their new body and be compassionate with them. My recommended resources for you today, if you're interested in learning more about health at every size, intuitive eating, and the anti-diet approach to healthcare are listed on this slide. Um, but ultimately, I would love to see more research um, specific to the CF population on the anti-diet approaches to health um, and CF outcomes. These are my sources. Thank you so much for having me today. Thank you so much, Jordan. That was excellent. Um, well, we won't be doing questions and answers right now. If you watch Netflix, uh, maybe you've seen Dave Letterman, and he has a program, a series on there. My next guest needs no introduction. I feel that way about our next guest. Um, Dr. Jen Ann Stallings is an icon. She is a mentor within uh, the CF community and nutrition community. I know she has been to me. We're so appreciative that she would be here today. Um, and if you can start walking up, if you want. Okay. Um, Virginia Stallings, MD, a board certified nutrition pediatrician and the Jean A. Kortner Endowed Chair in the Division of Gastroenterology, Hepatology and Nutrition at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. She is the research director in the Nutrition Center. I went to PubMed. Um, do you know how many articles you have on PubMed? Mm. Want to guess? A few? 260, but who's counting? Um, <laughs> Most of them are CF. <laughs> yeah, 50, and 57 of those specifically are articles that deal with nutrition and cystic fibrosis. She was the lead author on the landmark uh, 2008 evidence-based practice recommendations for the nutrition-related management of adults and, and or children and adults with cystic fibrosis and pancreatic insufficiency results of a systematic review. This was published in the Journal of the American Dietetic Association and really, um, I think, was so, so earth-shaking for us because we saw that connection between nutrition and um, lung function. Very powerful stuff. Anyway, I could go on, but I won't because I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Jen Ann Stallings. Thank you. First, before I say anything silly or welcoming, um, 
I want to say, Jordan, thank you, because I can't think of a better way for us to come to this complex subject um, from hearing it from someone who's lived through some of it, but also understands our science and physiology of nutrition and our psychology. So thank you for that. Now, that being said, I am so glad you're here in Philadelphia. I'm so glad we are here in person. Um, and I'm really sorry we didn't give you a World Series ex experience. <laughs> Last night, that's been a little hard on the community. Um, <laughs> but really happy, let's see. I get that one up. Okay, full screen, excellent. We're in the right place, the right room. Okay, it didn't work, then I come back. Okay, good. Um, so disclosures, I do a number of different things, much of it again in CF, but none relevant to what I think I'm gonna talk about today. Um, my structure, so here are a number of um, citations that when I was thinking about this talk that I went and looked at, and the nice thing is like every week or two, there's something else that is coming up that, that might relate. And um, I certainly don't have time to go through all of them, but <clears throat> I wanted you to have this. And the way I'm gonna approach the talk is I'm gonna move through sort of the evidence uh, fairly quickly. Um, and, uh, but really I think it's important to know what we do know now and sort of how we got here. And then I wanna use the last part um, to suggest how do we take a deep breath and what kind of framework can we use to, to really go into what I think of as the next generation of nutrition care in CF. Um, and you can tell from the introduction or my white hair, I've been doing this for a very long time. Uh, but I really can still remember um, the first time I met my first CF patient, I was talking to John and it happened to be um, at UAB in an intensive care unit. So when I think about next steps, I, I am so delighted that we're at this next challenge. But our question is, how, how did we get here? Um, so this is a graph. Let's see, can we make this full screen for me? For you? Hmm. Okay, never mind. This is good. <laughs> anyway, I call attention to this paper. And um, <clears throat> what you can see if you get at the very bottom this is following, this is where I should have changed glasses, following the changes in BMI uh, over a number of years. And in this paper, they, using the foundation data, they looked at those that were underweight, but used a definition of less than the fifth percentile, which is a valid definition, but probably not one I would use in a clinical care setting for CF. And their, um, use the classic definitions really for overweight, which was a BMI above 85, uh, or obesity above uh, 95. So if you look at that, they embedded in this, but not shown with a circle, <clears throat> is the, uh, the healthy weight or an acceptable weight, which would be between the fifth percentile and the 85th percentile. And again, clinically or in an individual patient, I'm sure you can appreciate, um, you know, that, that's, that's a broad range, but within all the variations, that makes perfect sense. But part of what I wanted to be sure and point out is the movement of the gray, of the blue dot, the undernutrition people as it came down, has been happening for a long time. <clears throat> and we should be proud of that. We've worked very hard in nutrition. Uh, this was before, um, the new modulator therapy, we had new antibiotics, all, thing, all sorts of things have happened. But we have worked for the last 30 or 40 years to reduce malnutrition, undernutrition in children, and to have better body weight for adults. Um, but then what you also are able to see is the increase in overweight status and the increase in obese status. And that's part of what's 
making us all a little uncomfortable now. But what I want to frame as we go through this is we really do have still three groups to manage. We have those who have undernutrition. If they're children, we also worry about poor growth status. If they're adults, it's mostly about weight for their attained height. Um, we have more and more people in the middle who have a healthy weight. And again, from Jordan's point of view, these are within ranges that, that all have um, general health promoting pieces. But we do have some who are going more into the overweight and obese. So um, if all of the papers you look at, you might want to look at this one because I thought it, was, it really helped. And then the same group um, looked at them, well, what does that look at per CF center? And the top, <clears throat> the top table is pediatrics and the bottom is adult centers. And you're familiar with this where every little line is an independent certified accredited CF center. And it really helps you though put um, some numbers to that. In pediatrics, those um, those numbers on the extreme, and this is for the this is for the uh, overweight and obese combined. Um, we have some children that have gotten chubby, but it's not a huge epidemic, and you can see as you go across it. And the other thing that we really have to keep in mind. You know, I go to a lot of different kind of CF meetings, and for the last two decades, most of those have always been now dealing with overweight and obesity and health. Uh, but here, we've really not struggled with that over the last 20 years. We didn't really even think about it. But as our patients start to get healthier and healthier, and the domination of the CF genotype and complications fades, there are other natural uh, genetics comes up. So when we start to think about what's going to happen, what would be there, if you will, non-CF uh, typical weight, what is going to be their patterns for diabetes, uh, for dyslipidemia, for any of those things. So all of this is just to, again, frame where we are. So these are data, again, that come from the patient registry. And you can see I've circled um, the one the, the children, the 2 to 19, BMI, height, and weight. And as a clinician, I tend to think of 30 to 70. I'm pretty happy in that range. Uh, but you've got to remember these data are always presented as medians, and they're meant to really just show our population changes. But if you look carefully at this and the children up to 19, we have not achieved what we want in weight. We're getting better in height. Um, and as you know, the BMI is a completely derived variable, and that's what you get if you do the math. Uh, and on the other side, you see um, the data for adults by men and women over years from 2000 to 2020. And if I drew a, a square around the BM, the desirable BMI fifth to the um, 85th percentile, that whole table is in that. So again, this is just to think about how wide a spectrum healthy, healthy weight is. And just to keep going with this, this is to remind us over these years, we have been using supplemental tube feeding and oral feeding, and we have accomplished a tremendous amount in children that they, we really reduce the amount of growth failure, both in weight and height. This has been going on for years. This is what hit us. And again, this is in the CF patient registry, and I, it's a wonderful diagram. But what it really shows you is what's happened since 2014 when the drugs came into clinical care um, and who was on drugs and who aren't. And one of the things from the uh, sessions, you know, the last couple of days, it's really become clear that Trikafta is, is effective, and it's even more effective in some of the people who might have started off in Ivacafter with just those simple mutations. But the idea that our playing field, our clinical practice, has been a little chaotic lately is true. We've had a number of drugs come 
come and go. And it's completely different. And again, there's been a lot of work on talking about who is not on drugs right now. And we've seen that 6%, and that's a combination of ineligible, mostly by mutation. Um, and again, this is just something else from the patient registry that shows you how in flux this has been, but how dominant uh, these medications are now. So I'm going to skip over these couple, next couple of slides fairly quickly, but just to remember, as I've said, this, the medication influence really started in 2012. Uh, Trikafta, the triple drug, came in in 2019. And much of what we, and then we had COVID, so we weren't really seeing our patients and all of that other stuff. But we really know that, yes, weight gain is associated, increase in stature is not as clearly associated. Uh, we don't know much about the dietary patterns that have changed with this. There were a couple of posters about that. We know it's a drug where we tell people to take it with fat, and it's important because it's more effective. Uh, so we really, this has created the issue of where we are. How do we balance preventing or treating growth failure in some groups and our increasing concern, and I would say even anxiety over the overweight status, both by our patients um, and by us. This is the other fact to keep in mind, um, and that is the CF population in the U.S. It's now majority adults. So even though this whole thing used to be dominated by pediatric care, it will not be in the future. So we've got to think about those two things. Um, and these are sort of the, less, the last of the foundational uh, data. So again, I always encourage us to start with length. So this is looking at the less than 24 month old and it's showing <clears throat> the, um, the box plot with the red line as the median um, for length and the median is still 32, not 50. Because a median, you would like half above it and half below it. For the weight percentile, we're up to 44, 45. So that's getting better. And again, the BMI as a derived value is high. In uh, the teen, well, in growing children, again, you can see the data here. And again, concentrate mostly on the medians for the individual variables. My plea to you is when you think about patient care, look at the, the height status in relations to genetic potential and the weight status in relationship then to the height. BMI to me is much more of an epidemiological term, which is why it was so important in that paper when we first started on this journey is could we prove uh, based on epidemiology with assumptions and associations uh, to honestly a lot of our pulmonary colleagues who really didn't still believe nutrition was important. So time to move on, I think, from some of that. These again give you the historical perspective of how are we doing with birth cohorts for weight. Uh, and that black dotted line is sort of the one that's getting close and looking like that might be the generation. Again, the height is much delayed. And for adults, again, we, we've spoken and see, have seen this in other ways. So now it really in adults, it is just about the BMI number. So we'll skip that because you've all heard about all those things. This slide I tend to keep because the evidence suggests that most of the weight gain happens during the first, um, actually happens very rapidly during the first month or two, but generally over the first six months. Uh, and as we start to see the long-term data, uh, we'll, we'll refine that. The issue is the pancreatic function going to change uh, is an emphatic maybe. And if you've been going to the same things I've been going to, you've heard, well, this might happen if you're pancreatic sufficient or if you're insufficient but had a little pancreatic function or if you start it very young um, and how important following longitudinal pancreatic um, fecal elastase and to how to guide all of us through that and our, and our families. So in that list of publications, again, if you want to delve into it, you'll find a, a, a bunch of other like interesting things. And I, I like this paper that was uh, from WashU. 
And they were looking at one year single center study and yes, in adults, and the BMI did go up. Um, and then they looked at the group that did not have CFRD um, because we're all a little worried about what comes with weight gain, those other metabolic complications possibly. Those that did not have um, diabetes at the time, um, the random glucose and the hemoglobin A went down, which are good things. Uh, those that already had diabetes, the random cholesterol and HDL uh, and LDL went up uh, and blood pressure went up across the cohort. And again, I will say that beginning to understand and manage lipids is going to be new for us because that's going to be the combination of their genetics. But clinically, I've seen thousands of cholesterol and more of them are in the out of range low value historically, uh, and the LDL was low, but that was because they, we think that was because they had chronic fat malabsorption. So all of these are things that we'll think about in the future. Uh, this issue of how to, how to consider uh, this was a talk uh, in the last meeting and did get published, so now there's all sorts of new stuff. And then this was, um, again, we've heard more and more about the different studies coming out. And the importance, the, the positive clinical responses so far are not as clear in the GI tract, although the GI tract may be the place that we're beginning to see the systemic um, inflammation be reduced. Um, and so this is, um, from that study, and again, it showed that the BMI in adults went up and the kids went up a little bit, uh, but most of that occurred uh, in the one month and three month visit. Okay, so here we are, what we've talked about is the legacy diet, which um, really was life-saving uh, when we learned between Boston and, and Toronto that a higher calorie, high fat diet uh, improved survival and it was based on that that we started giving more food and more enzymes and that's really what what started all of this um, but we did I think we need to take some responsibility about in doing that especially early on it was just about eat more calories um, and of course calories rich calorie, calorie dense foods or fats. So that turned into eat more fat because now we have pancreatic enzymes that work, that can cover the fat, which will allow most of it to be absorbed. So we really did go down that, that road and it was effective because that's what caused all the improved growth um, and contributed significantly to the improved survival. So now here we are trying to go back and forth. So it comes down to me, there's sort of a couple of frameworks. So if you have insufficient weight or weight status that's low, what are the risks? And you all know these, decreases survival, immune status, quality of life, performance, um, things that are very important now that we didn't think about as much 15 years ago, transplant readiness. Uh, pregnancy re readiness. And what are the benefits of being too thin or too short? There really aren't any in our disease. And then when you look at the excess weight status, the risk uh, seems to be in the group of older patients, those with milder uh, mutations, particularly those with pancreatic sufficiency, should be right at the top of our list, and to follow them from, for other things that are normal medical care following the blood pressure, certainly CF-related diabetes, um, lipids, but even these reports of lipids increasing, they're still within the range for the laboratory. They're statistically going up, but, and cancer. Um, so where do we go from here, I would suggest, is we still have to focus on dietary intake, but also dietary quality. We, like the rest of nutrition, has to have to move more to patterns of food intake, uh, to think about healthier fats. And we did 
because we didn't care about it very much, people tended to take too many saturated fats because we were just happy to have the calories. But that's an easy correction. That's what the whole rest of the population has been doing. So how do we think about, about this? It's important to know that the evidence for macronutrient intake, like what percent carbohydrate, fat, or protein, uh, is very broad. And there's no partic particular ratio uh, that confers health benefits. OK? And um, some of this comes from <clears throat> the dietary guidelines for Americans. Some of this comes from the very core fundamental thing that we all work off of is the diet, the um, dietary intake, the DRIs and the RDAs. So our goal is to use calories to get to a healthy weight and then to have a good pattern diet quality that would, for us, do some course correction on saturated fat and added sugar. And then just to say, I think you all should be familiar with the dietary guidelines. It comes out every five years. It's an arduous and fairly rambunctious sometimes review of the evidence of the past five years. Um, it is uh, driven by Congress. It's the USDA and HHS. And this is one of the documents that sets the foundations for all of the food programs in the US. So I, I was pleased when uh, the symposium from last year came out, the team put together looking at the, the dietary guidelines and modified them a little bit for what we might think about in CF. So that's in, in that paper. Um, I also want to say, because I heard it debated a little bit, um, the guidelines for healthy people for sodium and potassium, but really sodium intake, was recently revised. And I would encourage you to go look at that uh, because it is a wonderful review about sodium and health. And again, one of the things that's likely to change with all of the trikafta and maybe a little bit healthier um, GI tract is we may not be supplementing salt so much, right? The sweat chlorides are coming down. So w another big change is we're gonna move to how do you think about sodium uh, intake in people with CF. Um, I'd encourage you to look at it if you like that kind of thing. It's a huge book. I happen to be on the committee and it was a huge amount of work um, and it created this new concept. You know, the RDAs have, or the DRIs have an RDA or an adequate intake or an upper limit of normal. Well, now there's a new category of recommendation uh, for chronic disease risk reduction which will be a part of what we're all going to be about. Um, and um, the, the, so, the approach to sodium intake and in that I think we can do and be, in, be ahead of the game instead of behind. So where are we? Modul modul modulator use is huge. Uh, it's now up to, I had 20%, it's now up to 94%. Uh, I encourage us to keep watching for the data on pregnancy and lactation because the medications do get, do cross the placenta and are, are in breast milk. Um, we've got other things to think about there. And so here are my sort of foundations for the close. Um, this right now is very much going to be genotype and drug specific. We heard yesterday about treatments that are genotype agnostic. 10 years from now, we may be having an entirely different discussion. I encourage us to think about a handful of clinical presentations and to think about those with individual patients. So are they underweight or overweight? Are they pregnant? Think about getting pregnant. Are they newly diagnosed? Because in that, that presentation, we often have a good bit of work to do. Are they thinking about transplant? And I think we also haven't done much with approaches to nutrition and end-of-life care. I think we've got three age groups, you know, those under 24 months who are just getting settled into uh, table foods and growing rapidly. The two to puberty where there's still potential for growing tall. Remember, the only way I used to get by with all the pulmonologists to say, you know, if you're taller, you just got bigger lungs. 
you got more lung capacity. So tall patients are good. And then really uh, the, the adults and men maintaining weight and health until they're 70 years old. Um, this is very individualized, which is what all the rest of our colleagues in nutrition are talking about. We're right in the middle of that now. And that we have to stay nimble. Um, our nutritional goals, what our patients are going to need from us, will we'll keep changing. So I think it's one of the most exciting times for nutrition and CF. And I am positive we can do it. We just have to take a deep breath and start to organize our thoughts and, and potentially urge new guidelines, care guidelines, um, for us to do a good job in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. very pleased to announce our next speaker, Dr. John Lohman. He is an Associate Professor and Director of Residency Training in the Department of Physical Therapy at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. He is a board certified cardiovascular and pulmonary physical uh, therapy clinical specialist, and he serves as the outpatient physical therapy for the UAB Adult CF Clinic. His clinical and scholarly work in CF goes back over 25 years. He has published work ranging from exercise testing and prescription to lung transplant and ECMO, as well as pain and um, nutritional status. He was the co-author of the review paper, Overweight and Cystic Fibrosis, an Unexpected Challenge, which was published last year in Pediatric Pulmonology. Today, he will be discussing the role of, of weight exercise in weight management, uh, whether it is weight maintenance, weight gain, or weight loss. Welcome, John. Thank you. Well, I feel like I need to change the title of my talk after, um, after our uh, initial talk by Jordan. Um, Okay, so um, so welcome. Um, it's a hard two acts two acts to follow, and uh, and thanks for being here uh, late on a Friday afternoon. Um, so uh, okay, um, so I don't have any kind of uh, specific. Um, Conflicts to, to disclose, although some of the data I'm presenting it was funded by the by the CF Foundation. Um, so, in terms of an outline, kind of I won't read this too, but kind of this is kind of where we're where we're headed this afternoon. Uh, really talking about kind of exercise and the role of exercise in um, weight management. Um, so again, whether that's uh, folks are wanting to gain weight, lose weight, uh, maintain weight, uh, really, you know being healthy at that uh, the weight that our patients are that Jordan kind of emphasized so so importantly uh, so to start with um, and I know the audience here is primarily uh, nutritionists so um, uh, you probably uh, are really familiar with this but uh, for those that aren't um, energy expenditure is really just the the amount of calories the amount of energy that we expend in a day and it's divided up into you know um, multiple different categories kind of listed here uh, obviously, the primary one is just our resting metabolism. So we spend a lot of calories just being alive. Um, kind of from there, um, depending on if you're treating kind of kids or adults, uh, we, we spend some time growing. Um, so some portion of our food goes to growth. Um, I don't know about you, but during COVID, I grew a little bit more than I wanted. Um, uh, and, uh, and that was probably due to the intake reasons because I felt like during COVID and a lot of quarantine, physically active, I was a little bit more physically active than I uh, typically was as well. So um, physical activity kind of falls into two categories, um, uh, kind of specific exercise and then kind of non-exercise uh, activity. So we'll discuss that a little bit more uh, now. So 
Um, the, the broad terms of physical activity is just being physically active. So, I mean, you're, you're here at the conference, you're physically active, right? I mean, you're walking from one building to the other, to your hotel. Um, you've got a lot of physical activity. Um, and maybe because you're so active and so busy at the conference, you're not having time to exercise per se. Um, but that doesn't mean that you're not kind of active. You're not, you may not be exercising um, as you typically do at home, uh, but you're active here. You're moving around, you're going from places to places. Um, <clears throat> So exercise is a subset of physical activity, um, and exercise is really kind of defined as physical activity that is planned, structured, and purposeful. So there's some goal oriented to it. So you know somebody might exercise to um, uh, to lower their blood pressure. Somebody might exercise uh, because their cholesterol is elevated. Somebody might exercise um, for their mental health. Somebody might exercise uh, um, to gain weight or to lose weight. So exercise is kind of a goal oriented, purposeful activity. Um, you know, in, in terms of this, I try to stay really physically active, but I don't necessarily exercise so much. And so, um, although uh, it kind of shocks my, my students because I actually teach a class on therapeutic exercise and they ask me, well, what kind of exercise you do, do you do? And I'm like, well, I don't really, but I just stay really physically active. Um, in fact, uh, I'm on the 23rd floor and let me tell you, um, I thought that was going to be a lot of exercise and it was pretty tiring getting up to the 23rd floor, um, but, but I did, did my timer and really wasn't that long like it doesn't it's surprising how little exercise it is to walk 23 flights of steps um but uh anyway so this is kind of breaks it down into uh kind of a graphic uh expenditure so we can't really do much about our resting energy expenditure um that's just kind of our fixed um kind of our fixed cost and do we have uh oh shoot the does my Cleaner, go over here. Oh, yes. So this physical activity, energy expenditure, this is really kind of the, the big thing that we have control over. You know, so how much, uh, how much time we spend physically active, how much time we spend exercising. Um, this is the component of that 100% that we really have, have control over. Um, and so in terms of that physical activity, what are the kind of recommended guidelines? So we just left off with the dietary guidelines. Well, what are the physical activity guidelines? So just like, um, you know, health and human services, um, gives us guidelines for what to eat. They also give us guidelines on how much to do. And so if you'll focus kind of um, primarily uh, kind of here at the, at the right for now. Um, so the first example is, you know, 150 minutes uh, a week of, oops, too far. Um, 150 minutes a week of moderate intensity kind of aerobic exercise along with, uh, down on the bottom in the red graph, uh, two days a week of some kind of resistance exercises. So, you know, um, Two days a week of, of lifting things, uh, heavy, uh, heavy things, um, doing some kind of resistance training, whether that's uh, body weight, um, uh, and we'll kind of go into some, some examples here in a little bit. Uh, or kind of example two is, a com is um, 75 minutes of high intensity or vigorous physical activity. Um, so exercise is kind of dosed, um, you know, just like a medication. Uh, so you can take a, a higher dose more frequently. Uh, or less frequently, or you can take a lower dose more frequently and kind of get the same dose. And so this 150 minutes of moderate kind of comes out to be the same kind of dose of exercise as uh, 75 minutes of vigorous exercise. Um, and the um, over here, so the, the goal uh, can also be calculated in terms of um, kind of met minutes per week. So a met is, uh, um, most of you probably know, um, but is, you know, kind of one met is our kind of resting metabolic rate, you know, so when you're resting quietly. Um, so most of us here today, most of you are about one and a half mets probably right now, depending on if you're dozing off or not. Um, uh, but, you know, so one and a half mets and less is kind of considered a sedentary activity. You would kind of agree you're sedentary right now. Um, you know, maybe I'm up closer to two mets, still pretty, pretty sedentary standing here. Um, uh, three minutes is roughly a, a comfortable walk. So maybe, you know, when you were walking, you know, if, if you weren't in a hurry, I mean, kind of when you're going to your hotel or you're going from room to room, that's gets you to about three minutes, which is kind of the, the borderline of kind of moderate intensity kind of exercise. A brisk walk is more like four minutes. You get the five minutes, that's a really fast walk, or maybe breaking into a jog, um, just to kind of give you some, some perspective. Um, so, Using that example, so kind of taking a brisk walk at four METs uh, is a four MET level activity, 30 minutes, um, five days a week, gets you to that 600 MET minutes uh, per week of, of exercise. Um, and so while this can be a goal, a lot of our patients aren't doing anything right now. Um, and so to get them from doing nothing to doing, you know, 500 or 1,000 MET minutes a week, 
that's a lot, you know, so as long as they're doing more than they were. Um, now everybody, you know, lots of people, I've got the old Timex here, um, uh, no smartwatch for me, but, um, uh, you know, lots of people are trying to keep track of their steps and people have this kind of magic goal of 10,000 steps per day. Uh, well, a lot of people get, and in fact, there's good research showing that people get depressed um, because they're not meeting their metrics. They're not filling their circles out. They're not getting enough steps in. And so, you know, there's, now there's a, a, a lot of people that are stopping, uh, you know, getting rid of their smartwatch because it's, uh, it's causing, you know, similar to body image issues that Jordan talked about. They're having physical activity issues because they're not meeting their, meeting their goals. So as clinicians, we need to help them kind of step back on their goals a little bit um, and, and realize that, you know, going from some, doing something after doing nothing is good. You don't have to necessarily meet these uh, guidelines. Um, so in terms of types of exercise, you know, this is, uh, you probably uh, pretty much all know this, um, aerobic exercise, you know, cycling, swimming, um, uh, biking, uh, cross country skiing, if you live somewhere where you have snow, uh, is always a great exercise in Alabama. We don't really have that option. Um, exercise, the, the dose of the exercise. So exercises, it's kind of, can be a medicine um, and it has to be dosed appropriately. So again, the intensity and the duration and the frequency all go into um, that dose of the exercise. Um, resistance exercise, um, this is, you know, uh, shorter term, uh, more ana anabolic or anaerobic exercises that were, you know, glucose is primarily the fuel as opposed to um, sometimes with aerobic exercise, we can burn both carbohydrates and fats. Um, the goal of resistance exercise is to improve primarily strength, um, some hypertrophy, improving power. Um, a lot of our older adults uh, have power deficits. Um, uh, and uh, resistance training can also increase um, skeletal muscle endurance. Um, and again, the dose of uh, resistance exercises typically is, is kind of sets and reps. So a set is kind of, you know, one set of exercise. So if I kind of, you know, did, you know, 10 bench presses, that would be kind of one set of 10 repetitions. Um, so we can, we'll talk a little bit more about this in a minute, but um, uh, kind of the sets versus the repetitions. And the important thing that um, uh, to remember is the patients are getting ready to start exercising that they need to take a break in between. Um, so it takes about 48 hours to recover from a resistance training bout. That's not the same uh, with aerobic exercise. So aerobic exercise you can do, you know, twice a day, five days a week, six days a week. Um, I suggest not seven because, you know, I figure if God had to rest on the seventh day, we probably should too. Um, but, but specifically for uh, resistance training. And in fact, you can go try this at home, um, you know, uh, try to see how many push-ups you can do uh, today and do push-ups every day for the next week. My guess is after seven days, you can do less than you did the day um, because you've kind of fatigued out your muscles. And so they need time to, to recover. So our patients need to be informed. Yeah, if you're doing resistance training, you know, don't do your arms every day. You, know, you can do your arms one day, your legs another day, um, or split it up, but they need to, need to recover. Um, and that's in healthy patients that are well-nourished. So if our patients are undernourished, maybe they need even more than 48 hours. So those are the recommendations for uh, healthy adults. Well, what about um, if you have cystic fibrosis or your, your, your patient has cystic fibrosis, your, your son or daughter has cystic fibrosis? Well, there are um, specific guidelines, um, physical activity and exercise guidelines for uh, folks with cystic fibrosis. This came out uh, a little over um, five years ago, six years ago, I think. Um, <clears throat> and in this document, uh, it's broken down into habitual, and you can't kind of see this from the back, so I'm going to focus in on the adults, but there's a, kind of on the first column is the young child from um, uh, 1 to 6, and then 7 to 12, adolescents, and then the last column is adults, and then the rows are habitual physical activity, aerobic exercise, and resistance exercise. So I'm just going to focus here on the uh, kind of the statements for adults. So how much aerobic exercise should an adult with CF perform? Uh, and, the, and the recommendation is three to three times a week of 30 to 60 minutes uh, per session. So this is, you know, very much in line with uh, um, the physical activity guidelines for healthy adults, maybe even a little bit more, uh, maybe a little bit higher. Um, for resistance training, uh, what, how much um, should adults with CF do? Um, again, two to three times a week. So if you get the two to three times a week, you've got 48 hours in between, you've got uh, subsequent days in between. Um, a volume of kind of one to three sets of eight to 15 repetitions. Um, and that comes out to be kind of one repetition max, but don't take the, the, the repetition max so, so seriously. Um, the idea here and the, the thing that, the take home point that patients need to know is that if 
um, if they can't do eight repetitions of an exercise, then the resistance is probably too high and they need to kind of back off and do something until they can kind of do at least eight repetitions of an exercise. <laughs> Likewise, if, um, if on that second or third set, um, they can do 20 or 25 or 30, if they can just kind of keep going, then the resistance is probably too low, especially if they're trying to build strength and power, uh, which most of our patients are, are interested in doing. So, um, so that 15th repetition of that second or third set should be pretty difficult. Um, and if they can kind of keep going, then they know, all right, I've, I'm getting stronger. Now it's time for me to you know, change resistance bands or increase the weight or um, somehow alter the activity. Um, so in terms of exercise for weight loss, every, if someone who needs to lose weight, wants to lose weight, um, you know, it's always diet and exercise. All you need to exercise more. Well, um, exercise alone is, is not, not a great way to lose weight. Um, so this is a meta-analysis of aerobic exercise studies um, that looked at six to 12 months. And after adding two to four hours a week of aerobic exercise, so that's a fair amount of exercise, two to four hours a week of aerobic exercise, um, the participants in, um, in this meta-analysis, they determined they lost between three and four pounds. That's pretty disappointing, right? I mean, wouldn't you be disappointed? I mean, I would be if I started exercising two to four hours a week more than what I currently do and I'd kind of lost four pounds a year later um, and less than an inch. So about three quarters of an inch of waist circumference. Um, so exercise alone is not, not a great way to lose weight. Um, and why is that? It, well, for many of you that have exercised, exercise makes you hungry, right? In fact, um, sometimes we use it as an exercise stimulant. We, we encourage our patients to exercise because it's going to encourage them, you know, stimulate their appetite. Now they might eat a little bit more. Um, so there is that compensation. So, um, uh, so this particular study, they, they combined a, kind of a high dose, kind of more than 300 minutes a week. Uh, to about 150 minutes a week. And they found that uh, once you kind of exceed 300 minutes a week, you can't compensate for that much. Um, so you're exercising more than you can kind of compensate for with intake. And so this particular study kind of suggested that, um, uh, yeah, 300 mi minutes a week or more uh, seems to be kind of the threshold um, for including weight loss. Uh, but really, you know, it's not diet or exercise, it's, it's, it's both. Um, so it's really kind of the, the, the combination of the two uh, that is really important. And so in this program, um, so compared to the exercise alone, uh, this program was kind of a year long study and patients lost on an average of 14 pounds. So 14 is a lot better than, you know, three and a half pounds uh, after a year of, uh, of effort. Um, so just in summary, related to kind of exercise for weight loss and in folks without cystic fibrosis, um, you know, Exercise does increase, um, increase appetite and results in that comp compensatory increase in cardiac and uh, caloric intake. Um, higher doses of exercise kind of mitigate that. So if, if your patient wants to lose weight, um, if that's a goal of theirs, then they need to increase the, the duration, the time that they're spending per week. Um, and, and especially kind of that 300 minutes per week seems to be kind of the goal. And not just um, exercise, but dietary changes alone um, are gonna help. So what about exercise for weight loss um, in folks with cystic fibrosis? Well, this, you know, until recently, this hasn't been a concern. Uh, as Dr. Stallings mentioned, you know, it was primarily we were interested in um, them gaining weight and we didn't want them to lose too much weight. Um, and so in this particular paper um, that we published earlier, uh, earlier this year, um, we looked at folks, the, uh, it was a um, systematic review looking at all the, all the papers and people that had, um, were all the, uh, participants in the study were underweight or normal weight. Nobody was overweight. And there was no evidence that exercise um, caused them to lose weight at all. So, you know, if, if folks are at a normal, happy, happy weight um, and they don't want to lose any weight, there's no evidence that exercise is going to cause them to lose weight. Um, in fact, we found a trend that uh, with resistance training, folks were actually able to, to gain some weight. Um, and although there's no good high quality data yet, hopefully there will be kind of in the future as the, as the few, next few years go by um, on, on weight loss for folks uh, that are overweight or obese with cystic fibrosis. We do have um, a, a, a kind of a series of here of patients that I've, I've seen for an exercise uh, study. And you can see here that after six months of a combined aerobic and resistance exercise training program, they lost between four and seven pounds, 7% 7 of their body mass. Um, but as Jordan mentioned earlier, it's not all about the weight. Um, and so this one particular patient there, um, 
the, the patient here at the bottom that was went from 130 pounds uh, down to 121 pounds. Um, in spite of having, uh, so when we last saw her, she was kind of having an exacerbation. Her lung function had kind of dropped uh, pretty quickly. She, she got admitted after the, to the hospital shortly after this visit for IV antibiotics. Um, but in spite of her bad lung function, um, you know, her VO2 peak had gone up from 27 to 32. And so if you know much about kind of uh, peak VO2, that's a pretty dramatic jump. Um, if you can kind of increase that, by, um, you know, uh, by three, that's always three, three or four uh, kind of points. That's a big jump. So she had a, an impressive increase in her peak VO2, despite the fact that her lung function was going down concurrently. Um, and her peak power was up, so she was able, she was on a cycle ergometer, so she was able to generate more muscle power on the bike. Um, so she'd lost weight. Um, most of that weight that she'd lost was uh, body fat. Um, she actually had, um, felt like she had put on more muscle. So that was one of the things that was missing here was we didn't kind of get a good measure of, of body composition for her, but she felt like she was more muscular and, and that, uh, and she felt stronger and more comfortable in her body. Um, and this was a, you know, kind of an 18 year old, uh, 17, 18 year old kind of girl at the time. Um, so exercise does have uh, some positives for, for, um, for weight gain and th that, that particular patient was, a, was kind of a good example. Um, and that weight gain, um, positive weight gain, um, can be really kind of a change in body composition. So less fat, more muscle. Um, and unfortunately, I think what we've seen a lot in, in the last couple of years is our patients going on Trikafta, they don't feel like they're more muscular. Um, they feel like they, they've, they've gained fat. So it's probably a combination of the two. Um, but body composition isn't everything. Um, so I know there's been two sessions already this week talking about body composition. Um, and then here's kind of a perfect example over here of two, 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 two folks with a body mass index of 35. And uh, obviously they, they have quite different body compositions in terms of um, uh, muscle and fat contribution. Um, so hopefully as we go forward, um, you know, it, we need to advocate that our clinics that are, um, that we're measuring more than just uh, the, getting on a scale, uh, that we're measuring body composition somehow. Um, and although that is a number, um, it, it's a more relevant number uh, than just body mass. And so bioelectrical impedance is an option, uh, skin fold measurements or circumferential measurements. Um, DEXA is probably the, certainly the gold standard for that, but it is expensive and takes a little bit more um, specialized training um, for the folks to, to interpret. Um, so there are some studies showing that improved, the body composition improves um, with exercise training. So here was a kind of an eight week study um, that did not change body mass. So body mass did not change here. So the, the, the items in yellow are improvements. So there was an increase in fat-free mass, um, statistically, unstatistically, kind of a, a slight decrease in fat mass. Um, you know, notice that BMI BM, uh, and body mass did not change, um, but the patient was stronger, uh, they had better endurance, and they had more muscle mass. So these are kind of things that the patient feels, like they felt stronger, they felt like their endurance was better, um, and they did in fact um, put on more fat-free mass. Um, and here's just kind of a, another kind of example. So this was a kind of a skinny teenager with CF, um, uh, and um, uh, that then got really interested in exercise. So he, uh, he had a, a pulmonary exacerbation, got hospitalized, lung function went down a lot, and he decided he was gonna kind of improve his condition with exercise. And so this is him about 12 years later. Um, so, um, so people with CF can put on muscle. Um, now, obviously, we can't all put on muscle like this. There's a combination of, of genetic factors and, uh, and nutrition and exercise that do this. But, um, you know, how do you get, yeah, so this is, again, about 12 years apart, uh, I think, 12, maybe even 14 years apart. Um, so, um, you know, how do you get like that? This is, uh, this is Ben Mudge. Um, he's, a, he's a personal trainer with cystic fibrosis. He does, uh, he's evidently pretty busy. I checked out his website, um, and he's not taking new clients now. He's, he's busy enough. Um, but he lifts heavy stuff, um, and so he spends lots of time in the gym, and you can see kind of down here at the bottom, you know, that there's a big stack of weights here that I probably, um, I would just have to roll these across the floor. Um, so, um, but picking up heavy stuff kind of changes your, changes your physique. Um, but your patient isn't ready yet, you know, where should they start? Um, you know, exercises, uh, basic exercises that are body weight exercises, squats, are great with or without weights. Um, lunges are great exercise. Uh, Push-ups, um, bench dips. So these are four great exercises, kind of for using a lot of muscles, big muscles in your body, um, that your patients can use and um, 
uh, without any equipment. Uh, Pull-ups pull and bench press are, are kind of two other ones, but obviously they do require some uh, uh, some exercise. So how do we, adherence is a good, um, is a big problem. And so, you know, several people, um, you know, whether it's medication, whether it's diet uh, or other topics, we won't need to uh, get our patients to do the exercise. So motivational interviewing can be a great, a great tool for that. And so I'm just going to kind of finish up here um, with this kind of brief dialogue. So this is kind of the middle dialogue of a motivational interviewing um, kind of spiel. Um, and so the clinician kind of goes in and asks, so, um, so the patient isn't interested in exercising. And so you ask, well, all right, you're not interested in exercising, but if you did, what benefits do you think you would experience? Hmm. Oh, maybe I'd feel stronger and get less fatigued, uh, shorter breath doing my household chores. Oh, I didn't realize you got tired doing those activities around the house. It does sound like, you know, if you were stronger, those things would be easier. Um, would you like me to share some exercises that other patients have, have, um, have counseled, have utilized to, uh, to kind of overcome some of those problems? So you're asking them a question, and then if they say yes, well, now you're answering their question, right? I mean, they're like, yes, tell me, as opposed to you, you, exercise. You know, you're not telling them, they ask you for the advice. And so now you're kind of in a non-confrontational manner um, providing them uh, that information that they ask for. Um, so motivational interviewing isn't motivating the patient, it's using interview techniques so that the patient motivates themselves. Um, and so that can be quite, quite power powerful. Um, so I will stop here. Okay. And Thank you, Jane. While she's getting that up, John, 23 flights of stairs sounds like a lot to me. I, I, I don't know how fast you go up, but that'd take me a while. Okay. Yeah. Dr. McDonough, you want to start coming up? And our final speaker today is my pleasure to um, introduce Dr. Kimberly McBennett an Associate Professor of Pediatrics and Medicine at Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine um, and cares for adults with CF at the Leroy W. Matthews Cystic Fibrosis Center at University Hospitals and Rainbow Babies and Children's CF Center. She is board certified in internal medicine and palliative care and is seeking board certification in obesity medicine. She has been taking care of adults with living with cystic fibrosis for 17 years and has interests in nutrition, metabolism, and lifestyle medicine. Okay, I'm looking for the cursor. Hi there. It's uh, really a pleasure to be invited to participate in this um, symposium. So thank you very much to um, the moderators. Um, so my job today was to talk about the medical management of overweight and obesity in persons living with cystic fibrosis. I have no disclosures to report um, pertinent to this presentation. Our objectives are just to understand the trajectory of weight gain in people living with CF in the last five years, to understand the medications and surgery available to treat overweight and obesity, and to identify the gaps in knowledge of treatment and of overweight and obesity in people with CF, and to gain a better understanding of what our colleagues are doing um, around the world to address this health risk in people with CF. Um, after agreeing to give this talk, I did a pub med search to see what data was available, and I found that there is no literature describing the use of weight loss medications or bariatric surgery in people with CF. Um, there are no case reports, no randomized controlled trials, as you can imagine. So therefore, I'm going to be discussing the use of medications and surgery in people without cystic fibrosis, and I'm going to point out any unique issues we may face treating people with CF. 
Um, after I review the data from the medications and about medications and surgery, I'll review results of a survey that I sent out that many of you probably participated in, and I want to thank you for that, um, about what other centers are doing. I find this to be very useful um, when there's no data out there. This is one of the reasons I'm super interested in this topic, is data from our own adult um, CF center. So this top table is the percent of patients with a BMI of 25 or greater in each of the calendar years listed here. And this is just unpublished data from our CF center. So in 2016, 21% um, of our adults had a BMI at least once during the year of 25 or greater. If you look at this, let me see if I can put the cursor. Uh, maybe I can't. Um, but I do have a pointer. 21% um, of the adults in our center had a BMI of 25 or greater in 2016. Each year that number has increased to 2021, 38% of the adults in our center had a BMI of 25 or greater. And a, the, uh, the percent who had a BMI of 30 or higher was only 6.4% back in 2016. You'll see that number is more than doubled um, to 2021, where it's 13.3%. Um, again, we don't know what this means necessarily, but. One of the other things that I thought was interesting is if you look at cardiovascular risk factors, like having hypertension or diabetes, 40 to 50% of our adults have CF-related diabetes. So in 2010, only 7.7% of our adult patients had hypertension listed in their chart as a diagnosis. In 2022, 15.6% of our patients had hypertension listed in their chart as a diagnosis. Hypertension and CFRD together may confer a greater risk. We don't know, but in 2010, we had 4.1% of our patients who had both of these diagnoses listed in their chart, and by 2022, we had 10.4%. So this is a trend. Now, do we know what this trend means? No, I, I don't think we do, but I think we, it's important for us to at least think about it. Where is this going? Um, and of course, one thing I want to point out is a lot of really interesting things happened between 2019 and 2020, right? We had the introduction of um, Trikafta, and we also had a global pandemic that changed all of our lives um, quite significantly uh, between those years. So could there be additive health risks with obesity and having CF? So some of the health risks due to obesity um, include cardiovascular disease, um, and that tends to be from an increased incidence of diabetes and hypertension in people with obesity. Also, death from GI cancers is elevated, as well as the incidence of 13 different type of malignancies. Um, obstructive sleep apnea is more prevalent in people with obesity hepatic steatosis, otherwise known as fatty liver, urinary incontinence, and joint pain. And I, I just picked some of the ones I thought were the most relevant because we see a lot of these things in people with cystic fibrosis as well. Um, th there have been several articles about is cardiovascular disease something that we're going to see emerging in the CF population. Um, we know that our patients have CF-related diabetes, and we've always been taught, at least I was taught when I started taking care of people with CF a long time ago, that, oh yeah, people with CF don't have microvascular complications from diabetes. But I don't know that we can say that anymore. I think that uh, our, some people's thoughts are changing on that. We do know also that people with CF have stiffer blood vessels um, than people without CF. And I saw a poster yesterday where they described an increase in the pulse wave velocity in patients who started trikafta, and that can be associated with coronary artery disease as well. So we know that gastrointestinal cancers are increased in people with CF. That's why we screen earlier and more often in people with CF. Obstructive sleep apnea, for reasons that aren't related to weight, is increased in people with CF. 
it's through a different mechanism. Hepatic steatosis, again, a different mechanism, but an, another thing that what if these two things are additive? Um, urinary incontinence is more common in people with CF. Uh, it's usually due to coughing and pelvic floor uh, weakness and joint pain. I see a lot of my young women with CF who have joint pain. Now, could these, could overweight and obesity add to these issues and become an additive problem for our patients? We don't have the evidence for that yet, but it's something that I worry about. Now, this is an awkward transition, but my job today was to talk about the meds in surgery and if they could be used in people with CF and what our concerns would be. So that's what I'm gonna dive into right now. Of course, we know that every attempt at um, intentional weight loss should start with lifestyle modification, um, including diet and exercise. When these changes aren't enough to achieve clinically meaningful weight reduction or health risk reduction, as I like to think of it, um, medications may be considered. A BMI of 30 or greater is usually what um, is recommended for people to have. If you're going to prescribe medication, it's usually indicated at a BMI of 30 or greater, or a BMI of 27 or greater if there are comorbid conditions. Um, the important things to know are that not every drug works for every person. Um, and we've seen uh, lots of variability in people with CF and different drugs, and so we're used to dealing with that. When maximal therapeutic effect is achieved, further weight loss will um, stop. And long-term treatment is needed. This is not something that you give somebody medication to help them lose weight, and then you take that medicine away and, and everything's fine. This is something that is a continuous long-term treatment. And if you stop the medication, chances are that person will regain the weight. So the effects of weight loss and the effects of treatment for um, obesity can be seen with as little as two to five percent of body weight lost. Although generally it's considered that five to ten percent is clinically significant weight loss. So things like a decrease in blood pressure, decrease in lipids, um, improvement in hemoglobin A1c, improvement in fatty liver, and um, knee arthritis, things like that do uh, occur at between 5 and 10 percent of weight lost. Now, this is a very busy slide, and I apologize for this, but um, these are just listing some of the medications that can be used for uh, weight loss. Um, some are approved in the United States. Others are approved in both the U.S. and the European Union. In trials of these meds for weight loss, the placebo group had a small amount of weight loss from undergoing the same counseling. Um, so you, this first column here is the placebo group of the trials. The second column is um, the amount of the percentage of body weight loss with the medication. You'll see that for some of these, when there's two different numbers, that means there's two different doses of medication tested. And then the side effects of the medication are listed in this last column. So Orlistat is a medication that is a um, lipase inhibitor. It's essentially the same as taking away someone's um, pancreatic enzymes. And I'm not sure that any of us would think that that would be a great idea for um, any of our uh, folks with CF. Fentramine is only for short-term use. It's an appetite suppressant. Um, and these medications have also, you'll see uh, some of our colleagues have used this um, in the survey I'm going to show you here in a few minutes. But I, these two I have starred, and these are the ones I wanted to focus on, liraglutide and semaglutide, because um, these medications are GLP-1 agonists. And what they do is they help decrease blood sugar, decrease hemoglobin A1c, and they were developed as treatments for type 2 diabetes. Uh, what they found, though, is that people who take the medications, one of the side effects is weight loss. And I have seen our dietitian, or not our dietitians, our endocrinologists in our clinic start using these medications for people with CFRD. And you'll see in the survey that I'm about to show you in a few minutes that there are other centers who have also done the same. Um, some of the concerns I would have about these medications are that nausea, vomiting, diarrhea are 
common side effects, and they require the medications to be increased very slowly and titrated upward. Other side effects can be pancreatitis and gallstones, and those are things that, of course, we worry about in people with CF. So to compare the effectiveness of these different treatments, I included this graph because I think it's, it's very useful. These lines at the top are all the medications we basically just talked about and I showed you uh, um, data on. There's one additional medication called terzepatide, which is also um, a GLP-1 agonist uh, that is not yet indicated for weight loss. Um, and all of these, as you can see, cause clinically significant weight loss. That's what they're designed for. But this is how surgery compares to that. It has a much more effective, uh, is much more effective than just the um, medications alone. So indications for bariatric surgery for the general population for adolescents, class two obesity with a weight-related condition, or class three obesity. And for adults, it's a BMI of greater than or equal to 40, um, or a BMI of greater than or equal to 35 with weight-related comorbidities. Uh, I saw somewhere written in some of these uh, guidelines as I was reviewing them that you could do surgery for someone with a BMI greater than or equal to 30 with uncontrollable type 2 diabetes or metabolic syndrome, but there's not a lot of evidence to support that at this point. Weight loss after bariatric surgery in the general population looks something like this in the, that I'm showing you in this table. Um, there are many different types of surgical interventions and covering them all is beyond the scope of this talk, but I've listed three of the most common here. Um, in a retrospective study of over 65,000 patients, the one year mean percent total weight loss was 31% um, percent for the Ruin Y, 25% percent for um, the sleeve gastrectomy, and 13.7% for the adjustable gastric band. Um, and then five years later, there's still significant weight loss for these folks. Now, some benefits of bariatric surgery include improvements in metabolic parameters, long term survival functional outcomes, such as the joint pain and the urinary incontinence I mentioned before, hepatic steatosis, cancer incidence, and obstructive sleep apnea. There's, a, there's data that supports all of those can be improved. But there are obviously risks with surgery. And one of those risks is dumping syndrome, which is a group of symptoms um, such as diarrhea, nausea, and feeling lightheaded and just badly after eating which can happen for up to a year in some people after surgery. Things like gallstones, kidney stones, bowel obstructions, unexplained abdominal pain, malabsorption, and vitamin deficiencies, and also mental health issues. So as I, as I read that list to you, those are all things that we sometimes see in people with um, cystic fibrosis. So we would have to consider very carefully um, before we would ever uh, want to refer somebody for surgery. But that's, that's when we decided to do this, which was to reach out to other CF centers and um, see what people are doing in their CF center regarding um, the management of obesity. So we sent a survey to the CF physician, CF dietitian, and digest listservs requesting information about clinical practice patterns. Um, I have to thank uh, Terry Schindler and Zenthal uh, Sankara Karaman for developing and assisting with the, the distribution of this list I, or the survey, I couldn't have done it um, by myself. So thank you to all of you who took the time to complete it because it was really um, enlightening. Uh, we had 83 responses, which I'll go through with you quickly. Um, 60 dietitians, 16 pulmonologists, five gastroenterologists, and two advanced practice providers, uh, 26 of these folks dealt with pediatric patients, 38 with adult, and 19 with both. The center locations were all over the world, 78 in the US, three in Europe, one in Australia, New Zealand, and one in Canada. I think the most uh, interesting to me slide is next, and basically was the responses to what strategies have team members um, in your care center tried to 
help address overweight and obesity. Now this is a very busy slide and I know you might not be able to see it from the very back of the room, but at the very, I put this in list of uh, how frequent um, people said they use these interventions. So healthy eating was right at the top, which is great, increased exercise. I was a little surprised by the intuitive eating because this is something I'm just learning about um, in the last couple of years and we do recommend to our patients at the RCF Center, 57% um, of respondents said that they've used intuitive eating, which goes along with what Jordan said. Um, referral to an obesity specialist, I was also surprised that 37% of respondents said that their CF centers have referred to obesity specialists. Um, restricted calorie intake and decreased or stopped modulator therapy. So 12% of respondents said they'd seen people uh, decrease or stop their modulator, modulator therapy in order to lose weight. There's also 12% who uh, responded that they had initiated medication for weight reduction or had changes in their diabetes medications. Um, and commercial weight loss programs like Weight Watchers, et cetera, 10% of respondents said that they had seen somebody in their CF center use. Surgical options were 8%, intermittent fasting, 6%, medical weight loss programs like OptiFast or something like that, 2%, and then decreasing or stopping enzymes or decreasing and stopping insulin were at the bottom here, 2 and 1%. So what medications have been used to manage overweight and obesity at your CF center? Um, Semaglutide, which is one of those GLP-1 agonists that I mentioned, has been used by 17% of our respondents. And that was with the diagnosis of CFRD or type 2 diabetes. Semaglutide without, ooh, sorry. Hold on a second. Semaglutide without diagnosis of CFRD was only 1%. Liraglutide, which is one of the GLP-1 agonists with diabetes was 1%, and liraglutide without, just for the purpose of obesity, was zero. And then you can see here that, dang it, you can see if I would quit doing this. Okay, and then um, the bupropion and phentermine have also been used. Have you had any patients with CF experience side effects related to obesity medications? Um, some gastric distress with semaglutide, lack of efficacy with time, and an elevated heart rate. I guess I was surprised by this question, have any of the patients at your CF center had weight loss surgery? 76% um, said no, but 16% of respondents said that they have seen patients within their center have a gastric bypass, 6% have seen a gla sleeve gastrectomy, and 1% a gastric band. Have any patients at your CF center experienced complications associated with obesity surgery? No one responded yes. No, not that I'm aware of, were 80%, and unsure was 20%. And does your CF center offer a referral to an obesity, obesity specialist when your patient has a BMI over 30? 2% of respondents said always, 6% said usually, 19% said sometimes, 16% said rarely, and 31% said never. And there's some people who didn't have um, those services available in their area. I was a bit surprised with the degree of spread and the answers to this question. Um, usually in CF we see, you know, we have guidelines, a lot of us follow them and, and, and we do things alike, but this is something that we haven't seen before and is all, all new to us. Um, this question I think is super important. In order to have productive and compassionate conversations about the subject body weight, which can be emotionally charged as Jordan um, pointed out so eloquently earlier, it may be helpful to screen for body image concerns. And this is how many, um, this addressed how many CF centers routinely assess for body image concerns. 8% said always, 24% usually, 49% sometimes, 7% rarely, and 6% never. 
So in conclusion, more research is needed to find the health risks that may accompany increasing incidence of overweight and obesity in people with CF. We simply don't know what this emerging trend means for people, um, and we need to look into this. There are no case reports or clinical trials looking at the use of anti-obesity medicine or bariatric surgery in people with CF and overweight obesity. GLP-1 agonists may be a useful class of medication for people with CFRD and overweight or obesity for whom weight loss may be a desired outcome. And some of our colleagues in the CF community have been using these GLP-1 agonists and referring patients for bariatric surgery without any major side effects reported in our simple survey. And that's all it was, was a simple survey. So this is a list of um, references that I used to put the talk together. Um, this, the one, the two I'd like to point out is the one by Dr. Bailey um, and Dr. Cutney at the top of the list. Both of these are really nice, very eloquent papers about the rising incidence of obesity and cystic fibrosis and what that may mean. Um, and I want to thank everybody for taking the time to fill out the survey, if you were one of the ones who sent that back. I know that this is a very controversial topic. I got everything from thank you for doing the survey, it's such an important thing to learn about, to this is ridiculous and I can't believe that you're asking these questions. And so, so I think that just regardless of where you are on the spectrum of how you believe these things um, how they affect our patients, we don't know enough yet. We need to find out more. Um, and that's where we start with today, right? We're all having this conversation, which is super important. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. McBennett. Yes, will you please stay? And then we'll, can we have our other speakers come up? Um, we, we want to be respectful of your time as well. So we have about seven minutes left. Uh, for the end of the session. We thank you for the very many questions that you've submitted. There's no way that we're going to get to all of them. Just saying. question for the panelists. We've kind of put together some questions that have come up. Um, and we'll just kind of start and go down the row. Um, and this is two questions. Should CF, should people with cystic fibrosis be weighed at every clinic visit, yes or no? And body composition at every clinic visit, yes or no? Kim, would you start us off? That's an interesting question. I don't know the answer to that. I think of it as being a vital sign that we look at, but I don't believe that there's any such thing as bad data. I like to have the data, but then how we interpret that data and what we do with it, ultimately, it needs to be what we think about. So I would say, yes, it's okay to get the data. So that's a really good question. And I might, since I have an adult doc sitting next to me and we're trying to think about how to deal with this, you know, we're so focused on growth. Mm -hmm. But for adult care, might that be twice a year versus four times a year? If they, people get sick, you're always going to get it, right? Because mm -hmm. they're not right. in the hospital. But I, you know, I'm like you. I think of it as a vital sign. Um, and I might be able to do an age-adjusted approach to that, thinking of some of the teenage, young adult psychology. Um, and body composition was so much a part of our research for so long. I'm very interested in getting some information in and learning how to use it clinically. If we would do that, that wouldn't be every visit either. But what we might do if you're under 24 versus that other. But I would, I would think about, you know, not doing it every single time if there were no uh, self-report of weight loss or concerns. That's very provocative. That's a good first question. It is a good question. Um, I definitely agree. I think 
you know, as a registered dietitian, we're using weight to estimate patients' needs. Um, and so even for me personally, working in the oncology setting, I get weights sometimes every week for patients. Um, and that helps me assess their needs, helps me know what's going on. Um, but I think we have to think about, too, if how how that's affecting the patient's mental health. And so offering them the option to turn around on the scale so they're not actually seeing the number, I think is a good option. Um, and asking a patient, would you like to know what your weight is today? And giving them the option to know. Um, for body composition, I think um, it, it would be helpful to have some guidelines on that. <laughs> um, but maybe even like at the yearly visit, or maybe it doesn't have to be every visit, um, depending on again, how, how that may affect your patient's mental health. Yeah, you just kind of stole my thunder. Um, I was just gonna say, <laughs> ask the patient, do, do you wanna be weighed today? Um, and get their perspective. Um, and, and if you really need to know it, yeah, ask it, you know, do you wanna turn around and you know, we don't have to tell you what it is. Okay. We get the clinical data, but we don't have to engage so much. We have some pre-submitted questions um, that I think that we're going to choose one of those for just right now. Yeah. Um, Jordan, can you describe an example of a beneficial clinic, CF clinic visit regarding your overall nutrition status? Um, what did it look like? And can you pass that on to us as providers? Hmm. That makes me think, okay, so a beneficial CF clinic visit over, regarding my overall nutrition status. Sure, okay. Um, I think, you know, something that I mentioned in my patient perspective too um, was the discussion of that it's not just about the number on the scale. I think that was a really good, um, I think that's a good example, honestly. Um, and I've had many clinic visits like that because I got pregnant um, wonderfully and, you know, thankfully, I'm very thankful for that. And so there's also been discussions about, you know, breastfeeding um, when it comes to my weight and the worry about that. Um, I would honestly say there hasn't been a negative experience that I've had at my care team when it comes to my overall health. Um, I do think, depending on the doctor that I'm seeing, because there's a rotation at my clinic, um, sometimes they say, well, you, I have had one say, you need to be weighed, you know, every week while you're pregnant. And I said, no, thank you. Um, that was my decision um, because I didn't want that to affect my mental health. And they were very kind and gracious about that and understood that that was my decision. Um, but uh, again, I, I don't think there's ever been a, a, a negative experience. So I have a wonderful care team. Shout out to Cook Children's in Fort Worth. And we unfortunately have time for one last question. So I'm again going to address it to Jordan because you hands down got the most questions. Um, how would you suggest working with people living with CF who have uh, gained significant unwanted weight um, and who are trying to get in touch with their internal cues. Mm -hmm. They're going, trying to go in a more healthful, intuitive pattern, mm -hmm. but um, they state they're hungry all the time. Um, and if they go by that cue, they're, they're gonna gain even more unwanted weight. Sure, um, that's a really great question. Um, I would encourage patients um, to read for themselves some of the, the resources that I had um, listed on my, la on my one of my last slides, um, learning more about intuitive eating and the anti-diet approach. I think they need to see for themselves what their research is um, and, and learn more about it. There's a really great intuitive eating workbook um, by Evelyn Triboli, who um, also wrote, helped write um, intuitive eating. And so just having them work through that, I think can also be helpful. Um, and for those that are saying, oh, I'm you know, just eating all the time, um, I think we can ask them, well, what does your diet look like? Let's talk about the types of foods that you are eating um, walking and walking with them through that and seeing, okay, do we need to incorporate more fruits and vegetables, um, things with more fiber and protein that are gonna help keep you fuller, longer, and more satisfied? I think that's important to ask them as well. Thank you. Thank you.
Did you, would you like to add anything? Anyone? No, fine. That was lovely. It's good. Okay. Thank you so much for coming today. Thank you. To be continued.